We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, my tooth is fixed. That was good because yeah. uh, it was Thanksgiving yesterday. I'm full of turkey and pumpkin pie. So happy Thanksgiving, Canadians. Why do you guys eat turkey too on Thanksgiving? Are you copying us or what? I have no idea who, who's came first. But uh, but we celebrate ours earlier like in the ours year, did. so I'll say us. <laughs> no, that's not how that works. Yep. Exactly I don't actually works. like turkey for, I mean, I often eat turkey at Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. but I almost never cook it myself. Mm. If I cook, it's going to be a standing rib roast or a lamb of some sort. I like lamb. Isn't ham the other ham turkey. the other traditional Thanksgiving thing? My wife's, not my wife was raised in a half Muslim household, gotcha. so she doesn't, she doesn't, I mean, she'll eat the crap out of some bacon, <laughs> but she doesn't want, <laughs> she doesn't want like just pork by itself uh-huh. or she doesn't want bacon in her stuff mm. like she doesn't want a bacon cheeseburger she wants bacon and a cheeseburger she doesn't want it together which i find weird but i can i mean whatever you know that's fine <laughs> and i can understand too i didn't really i wasn't really raised uh we need that much fish mostly because we were poor but uh also because i guess we just didn't but uh i i didn't grow up eating fish so i don't really eat fish all that much i don't mind it i just don't ever order it almost ever <laughs> ever unless it's tuna i really like tuna <laughs> it's like the that's like the baby bottle of fish gotcha anybody can eat tuna all right this is av rent the podcast can answer your home theater and av questions to get your questions answered all you have to do is ask ask by emailing us at question at av rent.com mm-hmm. you go to www.avrant.com and leave us a comment there facebook.com slash av rant podcast you can watch our recording sessions live and i guess post-production on youtube.com slash av rant you want to contact us directly it's rob at av rent.com his twitter is at first reflect i'm tom at av rent.com my twitter is at av rant underscore tom i forgot it for a second but i got it back <laughs> it's yeah covered well oh you would forget Nailed that it. at this point only said it every uh, week I mean, for 11 years something like that mm-hmm. it's been a while oh wow so, uh, <laughs> I got a Fitbit. Fitbit, okay. Got to check those steps <laughs> while you're sitting down and talking. It usually doesn't reach from here. No, well, I mean, it tells me what my... I got it mostly just so I could see my text messages. <laughs> I really don't care about the rest of that nonsense. <laughs> I was jealous of my wife sitting there, and she's like, everybody put your phones away. And then she'd look at her wrist mm-hmm. for a second, and then she put it back down. I'm like, that's cheating. Well, hey, I guess I, I guess cheat. you could get that new uh, Google... Uh, or not, uh, not Google, Amazon, Amazon Loop. Because they, they couldn't call it Ring because they already bought a company named Ring. So they called their finger ring a loop. So you get that yeah, Amazon what does loop. that do? Uh, it, it puts uh, she who shall not be named on your finger. Because that's what we have like all... Like Sauron's at the Ring of Power? what we've all <laughs> dreamt of is having that A-lady on our finger. Oh, man. That's, that's right. She can tap you. I, I still laugh when people talk about how... You know, they're not going to buy a, a wiretap for their house. I'm like, Amazon doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> there are real live people listening, but they they also still don't care. They just want to get through their they day. Don't. They really just want to get through their day. <laughs> they really, really don't care. <laughs> All right, we want to thank our listeners of the week. Become a listener of the week and support the podcast in some way. If you want to support us financially, you can go to patreon.com slash podcast, where you can sign up for a monthly subscription. It's a monthly draw from your bank account where they give most of it to us and keep a little bit for themselves a minimum is a dollar maximum is a million thousand trillion infinity infinity dollars. just keep hitting zero yeah see how far it goes so we, we want to thank our 86 patrons over at patreon.com including brian brian specifically mentioned that he was a patron so we want to mention him if you would like us to mention you let us know you're a patron yep that's all it takes me. thank you very much to our 86 patrons over there and uh we didn't get any this week but if you just want to make a one-time donation you don't want it recurring uh just come to our website avrant.com and over on the right hand side it says support av rant there's a picture of a cup of coffee and that link will just take you to paypal 
So you can uh, hand out a one-time donation via PayPal if you want to, and you don't need a PayPal account. Uh, You can just use a credit card without signing up for a PayPal account if you want to do that. If you can't support us financially, we understand. Just figure out some way to support us Mm -hmm. and let us know what you did. So one way you can do that is by correcting us. Absolutely. Or, in this case, (laughs) uh, letting us know that somebody else's correction was also correct. So Bill confirmed Mike's correction from last week regarding the 20 amp circuits, where we mentioned that if you want to have a 20 amp circuit, should you have to have 12 gauge wire in your wall? That is correct. And Bill confirmed that. Absolutely, yes. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Bill. And uh, yeah, always, always welcome corrections. We know we have at least two people listening closely in Bill and Mike. It's it's incontrovertible. They at least made it through. For the first five minutes of the podcast. That's right. All right. Uh, let's see here. This is news. This is news. Mm-hmm. You never guess the official name of Sony's next gaming system. It's the drum roll, mm-hmm. please. Mm-hmm. What could it PlayStation be? PlayStation Five. Whoa! I know they did it. I I, I pegged that. By the way, yeah. So many people got their prediction game. right. We all won the yeah. office pool. All of us. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Thank you, PlayStation. Thank you, Sony. Yep. I very rarely say thank you, thank you, Sony, but thank you, Sony, for not coming up with a stupid name for your thing and just, just, just <laughs> version five. I did like that because uh, the un- what's Xbox One going to do? Is it going to be Xbox One X? I mean, it's going to be something stupid. Well, some people were pointing out that you know it should just be like following along the mathematical points on a spiral line. So the next one should be like Xbox minus seventeen eighty. Because that's where the <laughs> that's where the next dot should fall on the line on the graph. Yeah, no, that's what I, I did like the uh, the Onion article where uh, they're like, yeah, Microsoft just devastated Sony by announcing the PlayStation Six, the Microsoft <laughs> PlayStation Six. <laughs> that would so fool so many people. Yes, it it's would. not even. It, it is disheartening to think <laughs> how many people would go out there and go see the. The Sony PlayStation 5 next to the Xbox PlayStation 6 that's and right. buy the Xbox PlayStation 6 and they'd be mad that the game they I mean, wanted, that's why they God went of with War, doesn't run on it. That's why they went with 360 for their second system because they're like, it's going to be up against the PlayStation 3 and we've got to have a 3 in our name. We're going to be 60 better than we that. can't be the Xbox 2 or it won't stack up to the PlayStation 3. That's a, I don't know. They probably weren't wrong about that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, it'll launch holiday 2020, So, and Sony has now confirmed it will include an Ultra HD Blu-ray drive, which, again, shocks nobody, <laughs> uh, including the ability to play Ultra HD Blu-ray movies. Well, I mean, the PlayStation you, 4 I Pro mean, can <laughs> do it, so... Yep. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. Uh, they introduced a new controller, which looks a lot like the current DualShock 4 for the PS4, but they've replaced the rumble with a full haptic feedback. It has little spikes that shoots out into your fingers whenever you do something wrong. Somebody believes me. Mm. Sorry, you person. Tap, tap, tap. And game developers can now program how much resistance the triggers apply to your fingers. Oh, God, how many broken controllers are we going to have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, they want to be able to make sure the trigger of each gun feels, you know, exactly like it does in real life. That's the goal. That's really... Really terrible. <laughs> the first residential installation of the U.S. Uh, in the USA of Samsung's The Wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like Pink Floyd should have something to say about I that. I know, right? right? Let's go on. <laughs> a 146-inch micro LED display was uh, completed in Southern California. Samsung factory personnel were on site, and this installation took three days. The display requires 20-amp uh, electrical service with 12 gauge wire yep. going all the way back to the panel <laughs> and the installation company says they were pleased that the existing structure did not require a reinforcement to support the display's weight which has been decreased since the first prototypes dude how heavy is this thing i think it was supposed to be that heavy but whatever <laughs> uh the price was not disclosed and uh so if you go to Flickr and see the pictures or if you're on youtube and you're seeing them now mm-hmm. you'll notice this very beautiful room which honestly does not look that much less like a normal flat panel display on the wall oh it's, it's, just, it's big though that, it's 146 it inches big. so good luck getting one of those <laughs> so if you're looking for the speakers in this room take a guess where the custom installers put the speakers because those are some just solid take looking a guess. walls those are some Dude, solid it, looking flat it is wooden walls wood paneling on the walls yes. 
on at least the, the uh, around the TV and on the right wall, mm -hmm. wood paneling everywhere. There's carpet on the floor, and it's a drop tile ceiling, so there is some theoretical absorption in here. Mm -hmm. But where are the speakers, Rob? Where are the speakers? Where could they possibly be when you're dealing with something uh, that was listed in CE Pro? Yeah, they're all in the ceiling. All in the they're ceiling. Every single one of them. They're all up there. Yeah. Because they clearly you know care about the acoustics in this space, man. Yeah. If <laughs> I just want the next time some a hole custom installer installs all in ceiling speakers, that he also installs a, a chair that is like right next to the ceiling, <laughs> so that your <laughs> your head's like basically touching the ceiling, like this big staircase up to it, like a lifeguard seat, mm -hmm. but for sound. Because <laughs> that's the only way you're gonna get a decent surround mix out of this stupid thing it's just why that tv is probably what a hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something like oh, that and you way can't more get, than that it's way you more can't than get that. decent speakers in here you can't get a decent speaker layout i mean it disgusts me that somebody would have <laughs> so much money to spend on the display and so little care about anything else that's going on. It is literally like buying a car and never driving it. It's driving all it. about just the, parking it in your garage. It's all about the looks. And they were told, oh, we can absolutely overcome any aesthetic concerns that you might have. We have these instantly speakers with angles built in. It'll be perfect. Yeah. They worked with the designer. The designer designed the room and did not give one iota of thought to where the speakers might be. Because they watch HGTV well, and there's never any speakers. In fact, there. if they were like, "Yeah, if we see a speaker, that's that's the end of that." So, right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. <sighs> <laughs> but they got that big old TV. That's what they got. And uh, I understand. Mm -hmm. You don't have. Not everybody has the time in their lives to care about everything. They pay other people to care about it. But I wish they would pay other people to care about it who actually cared about it. <laughs> Not just scared about making all the money. You know, I mean, it's a five minute conversation with, the, I, I just want to hear the owner say, yeah, we talked about having, you know, four, you know, speakers all the way around and the way you're supposed to, but it was really important the aesthetic look at the place. So we decided to go with end ceiling. That would be enough for me. That would mm, be enough well, for me to say, at least they considered it. That's, but maybe I it was along those lines. The case. It's more like the, every, this guy's no. friends, everybody they know. All their speakers are in the ceiling too, because that's what they always do. So, well, I mean, I've been in houses like this where they have a big TV in this beautiful room that is absolutely acoustically awful, mm -hmm. and all the speakers in the ceiling, and the owners can't operate the remote. Yeah, that too. They just have no clue on how to turn the thing. They they're like, I press a button. If it doesn't work, I have to call somebody. Yep. <laughs> uh, so that's what I assume. I assume that because that seems that has been my experience. So maybe I'm wrong, but whatever, dude. If you've got if that's your wall and you've got something to say to me, bring it, bring it, come at me. All right, comments, Cody. When we were recommending Wi-Fi speakers that can also do Bluetooth for two hundred dollars for Sean last week, Cody thought of his own setup and wanted to share because we mentioned how the desire to have Wi-Fi limited the options, especially if running it all on battery power was the goal. In his case, he's using a Chromecast audio connected to a small power bank battery. He can plug that into any Bluetooth speaker to add Wi-Fi and streaming source. He knows the Chromecast audio is discontinued now, but you can still find them. Uh, for sale or, or the same concept could be used with a different streaming device so yeah if you have a usb uh outlet on your because that's what chromecast goes no chromecast, no, chromecast is, is hdmi uh no chromecast audio was just a regular 3.5 oh, millimeter right, 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 right. Uh, audio jack or you could also use uh, optical coming out of there with the uh the mini optical uh plug would work on the chromecast audio so that's right. why it was a nice device because that made it very easy to plug into pretty they much it was anything. only around for like a year though right it feels like it was only about a year before they discontinued. i'm not that sure I, uh, one or two years but it's discontinued now uh but no i mean the the general idea of just having some outboard streaming device the, uh, the idea being that you know now you can pick any bluetooth speaker that you like many of which have batteries built in so that's not difficult to find and not only that but many of them have uh usb ports that are for charging uh your right. phone or whatever right. they 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 come with that in mind which means that if you a lot of these chromecast and streaming devices they plug into your tv's usb port to charge yeah, while to they're the power, going yeah. so yeah that's actually a really good suggestion i like sure that. i don't know what exact streaming service you could use these days other than the chromecast audio <laughs> but i'm sure we'll, we'll look for something 
Joseph continues to find ridiculous audiophile cables to laugh about. Uh, we have actually the bottom of our topic list has had for oh yeah five years, five six years a at list, this point. Yep. Yeah, a list of audiophile products that if we ever get to the bottom of the list and run out of things to talk about when we want to continue <laughs> going, we can go through them. We just never get to it because you guys have too many questions, which is great. I'm just saying, but it's been down there for a really long time. At this point, I'll Oh, it like, is one way out of date. <laughs> one of them somebody complained about the Xbox 360 or something. Paul, I think set, so. set up. I think so. Yeah, that one that's how old it is. It was pre yeah, 7 Xbox years ago one. then, yeah. All right. Uh and uh, after we offhandedly joked about the thousand dollar power ca cables, he knew we lowballed that price point. That is true. That thousand dollars is actually there's other file power cables that are a meter long yep. and way more expensive than a thousand dollars is cheap in that world. <laughs> Behold, he says, the Bella Sound uh, Kalua Kaula Kalua Kalua Kaula. one. <laughs> Anyways, it's a two meter uh, power cable for. $2,700. Yep. They claim it's power conditioning right at your equipment. Com combing. Yes. I guess it's combining. It's supposed, it's to, be supposed combining, to be combining, but, they, but that... But it, in the copy on the website, it says combing. That's right. Because and I am, I am it. copying that verbatim because they deserve it. <laughs> the elements of quantum level noise... What? The elements of... What? <laughs> Let me try again. <laughs> I can't even get to the this first five words believe before me, I because no one could. I could not come up with this. So. <laughs> Combing the elements of quantum level noise absorption with ambient temperature near superconductivity techniques. <laughs> yep. Not, that's those are some words. Dot dot dot. Those are words that all are big and make people ambient so temperature near superconductivity. Okay, so they've literally done something that nobody can do yeah. well the whole idea of uh quantum computing is superconductivity but they right isn't that right but they have to have mm. it at near like near absolute zero to make it work well yeah to so. make superconductors they need to be very low temperatures uh yeah. quantum computing doesn't necessarily require superconductivity but uh yeah yeah in any case Anyways, they threw this, all the words this, in yeah, they got all the, they got all the words they did. in one sentence, so they didn't have to write too much. Uh, two meter AC cable, twenty seven hundred dollars. It uh, comes with uh, two hundred hours of break in, which clearly yep. will make a big difference in the sound in your system when you you gotta line up those, those quantum's. So for a long time, just for those of you that are kind of new to this world, this you would read in reviews people taking speakers that they had gotten for review and putting them in a room and throwing a a blanket heavy blanket over them and playing a lot of times just music but mm -hmm. sometimes pink noise sometimes other things oh sometimes there's a like, specialized te uh, disc or track that is specifically yeah. for the purposes of break-in yes and the idea was that it would loosen up the woofers and make the speaker sound better or mm -hmm. whatever and it would play for like a month they'd like put it in there right. for like a month right it's which is ridiculous it's not gonna it, there's actually a a driver break-in test that they did on uh, Audioholics to see, you know, you can measure something that is more, is more, uh, uh, has more ability to hear things in your ears. Mm -hmm. They measure the differences between a driver, you know, at when they first take it out of the box versus whatever. And, uh, you know, all small drivers had zero change pretty much. And I think the, the, bigger woofers like for subwoofers within was it like five seconds Whatever i thought it was half changed. a second i'm pretty sure it was half Whatever. a second because it it, it yeah. did take some time for the voice coil to warm up to uh to full heat and for the suspension to move once once so uh <laughs> yeah half a second it's legit well so basically what he he surmised is any break-in that needed to happen was happening when each driver was being tested to see whether or not it worked at all mm. as it left the factory <laughs> and just that little blah, blah, blah that they did to make sure that it works was enough yeah. to 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 get it but anyways so breaking in a power cable is running electricity through through it for 200 hours yeah. because I'd like to see how much. I'd like to see their power bill. Maybe that's why it costs twenty yeah, seven hundred dollars. Literally nothing. They 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 never plug that thing in. Why would they? No. Why would they? And well, risk all the rest of it is scratching the copper finish off the the 
the ends all, or whatever yeah. that was. Uh, uh, all the rest of it is clear, clear BS. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's not copper either. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure they it's I, rhodium. I it. It's got to be rhodium, right? Has to be at this level. I, I don't know. In any case, they claim that you will hear the incredible difference from the first yeah. note. It's yeah. a steel. And tone. if you don't, it's, it's not. It's your. It's your speakers. That's right. Or your your preamp, or your DAC. <laughs> it's definitely not, not your room, though. It's got to be something in your gear. Something they you will never say anything bad about your room. That's your right. room is immaterial to this entire thing. Yeah, don't get us started on, on on this type of product because this is <laughs> stuff that. Yeah, we've talked about it before. We're going to create a store called Best Sound Audio. Oh, we shouldn't give that away. <laughs> we can't let people in on the secret. We might still do it one day. Yeah, we are. Do Best Sound Audio. Yep. We'll, we'll, we'll break in all of your ca power cables. All right, let's answer some questions here. Carl, audiophile review posted an editorial on the topic, which are more accurate, headphones or loudspeakers? I did not read this, but it's called audiophile review, which I think it's... I'm, <laughs> I either blocked them or they blocked me. I'm mm. not sure which one happened first. Could so, be. Anyways. Yep. No, yeah, that's uh, that's the article as posted. It immediately goes off the rails talking about amplifiers and reference tracks because audio files. Yeah. But ultimately, they conclude that no transducer is perfect. Okay. Okay. Processing and tuning are used to try to compensate for some set of assumptions about the listening environment or human hearing. And the final answer is neither. Because even the very definition of accurate is too hard to pin down. Mm. So what's our take? If someone were to ask which are more accurate, headphones or loudspeakers, how would we respond? Accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like that word so much. Um, I mean... <laughs> Well, I, w I would say this. If, if I were to define the term accurate as uh, it is reproducing as closely as possible the original waveform. So, I mean, of course, the waveform has been translated in all kinds of ways, right? It's, it's from right. the original uh, sound wave in the air. That then goes into a microphone. So that's a translation right there. And then that is converted into an electrical signal. Of course, that is a translation, uh, most likely an analog signal at that point, but most likely translated into a digital waveform at some point and then back into analog and so on and so forth. All of these translations happening. But if we make the overall idea that that waveform was maintained or at least whatever the end result of the recording was, we want the transducer that now takes that recorded signal that was translated into an electrical signal, which is now translated into physical movement. And we want that movement to be as close to the waveform that's in the recording. Then speakers will attempt to do that more so than headphones because... If simply, if simply because of the subwoofer. So, you know, well, and it's not just that. It's that, that headphones that always have some kind of curve applied to them because if you inserted a truly linear representation mm -hmm. of the waveform directly into your ears, it wouldn't sound right. Because... Right. We that that linear representation was an external microphone. Well, the the there's a whole caveat to this, which is a binaural recording. In a binaural recording, the microphones are embedded in a dummy head or sometimes in a real live person's head, and now we want the headphone to reproduce that exactly as it was. And if you played that sound, a binaural recording made inside of a dummy head out of loudspeakers, it'd sound real weird. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I mean, I agree neither because it depends on the recording. For one, a binaural recording needs to be played through headphones and won't sound correct coming out of loudspeakers. But a recording that was intended to be played out of loudspeakers, if headphones reproduce that truly linearly, accurate to the signal, it'd sound really weird to our ears. So headphones pretty much always have a curve to that. So, uh, yeah, there you go. That's my take, Carl. This is an argument that does. Honestly, my take is that this is an argument that doesn't need to be had. You it know, really doesn't. I mean, this is it, it. It's the sort of thing that people who just you know who love their gear mm -hmm. want to prove that their gear is the best gear. And uh, when you've been doing this as long as I've been doing this, and, and Rob as well, but 
when you've seen as much gear go in and out of your room, you very quickly s stop having that emotional response to it. That sort of, <laughs> I paid money, I paid this much money for it, therefore it must be good, because if it's not good, then I wasted my money, and therefore mm. I'm a bad person. Well, I mean, to me, it's a fairly well, I, simple thing, which is that if I play a sweep where it's all yeah. of the frequencies that my human ears can detect, and that sweep said, play all of these sounds in one continuous sweep, all at the exact same volume level. If I perceive that sweep to play any particular sounds along that frequency sweep at levels higher or lower than the rest, then I will say, well, it's not... It's, uh, the loudspeakers are not alone. They're in a room. They're connected to other equipment. Right. I'm whatever listening distance away. The headphones are not all by themselves. There's still all the interaction that's going on. But if I end up perceiving that frequency sweep as something other than all of these sounds came out at the same volume level, then something is distorted in terms of how accurately it's being reproduced. Simple as that. But that distortion, like in the case of headphones, like you take... So we take a, a speaker and we put it in a room and that speaker you know, tries to reproduce those sounds, those waveforms exactly as they were. Well, they're not mm -hmm. they're not alone. They're, there's the room and everything else. That's so right. what you hear is being attuned and changed by the room. So you have to now to either take the room out of the equation mm -hmm. and say, okay, loudspeakers are can be more accurate. In because an anechoic they, chamber? Sure. In the anechoic chamber. Whereas headphones, you know, they are always having this, you know, in order to make sure it sounds normal to your ears, they have uh, a curve applied to them. Mm -hmm. Well, you're also taking the room out of the equation a lot of times yes. with that. And therefore, people who have who have really expensive headphones are like, well, my headphones sound more accurate than my mm -hmm. speakers. Well, mm. yeah. you know, it, neither one of them sounds exactly the same. And you take that same musical experience that was recorded and you put it in a different musical venue and it sounds different so mm -hmm. you know there's a lot going on here so whatever just don't worry about it <laughs> let's get to the next question here derek this is the long one derek has got a very long question apparently we missed him which so we apologize derek we don't often do that that we are aware of so oh it's certainly not intentional sure that... no i just uh, somehow this was in my inbox i i mistakenly overlooked it i apologize derek and we're getting to it now all right. So Derek wrote us previously saying he had added rear speakers, but no sound was coming out of them if he used Xbox One for any streaming video apps. We remember this question. We speculated that maybe he had added, actually added side surround speakers since the term rear speaker is entirely clear, but now he's written back with more details. His receiver is an Onkyo TXNR636, which can use a maximum of seven speakers, and it can decode Dolby Atmos 5.1.2, but not DTSX. Derek was previously using a 5.1 setup, and he had his Xbox One to output 5.1 uncompressed PCM, and everything was working fine. Yep. He added the 6th and 7th surround back speakers. He can play the trim level test tones in his Onkyo, and the pink noise plays out of the correct speakers, so they are all wired correctly. He can use his Xbox One to play Blu-ray, and the 7.1 Dolby True HD or DTS HD Master Audio plays perfectly. He can also play a game that is clearly labeled as having 7.1 audio, and with the Xbox One set to output 7.1 uncompressed PCM, those play perfectly. Some 7.1 games offer a little audio test section, and the test tones play out of the correct speakers, so Blu-ray movies and 7.1 games those are fine, yep. which historically has been the case with the Xbox One. It's when you get to streaming services and other things that you have yes, problems. Yes, indeed. Oh, and here we go. And the only problem arises when he goes to use a streaming <laughs> video app. He specifically went looking for 5.1 content and found someone Voodoo. I'm sorry, 7.1 content and found someone Voodoo. Some of the movies are clearly labeled as being 7.1 audio, but if he leaves the Xbox One set to output 7.1 uncompressed PCM, which again works perfectly for the games, no sound ever comes out of his surround back speakers. Yeah. These 7.1 movies on Voodoo seem to only play in 5.1, and since the Xbox One is set to output 7.1 uncompressed PCM, he can't even use an up mixer, which has always been the case with the stupid Xbox One. His surround backs just sit there doing nothing. Then, just in case it's all Voodoo's fault, they just and they just mislabeled the audio track on some of their movies. He tried playing some MKV files in Plex, mm -hmm. which he knows for certain are in 7.1. Once again, his Xbox One... Uh, set to output 7.1 uncompressed PCM, his surround back speakers are completely silent. So we tried other available audio output uh, settings from the Xbox One. If he sets it to 5.1 uncompressed PCM, the Voodoo movies, and the 7.1 Plex, uh, 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 Plex MKV files play fine in 5.1, of course, and he can upmix 
uh, so that surround come, sound comes out of the surround back speakers, but then he feels like he's missing on some discrete uh, 7.1 audio, particularly from the games, and manually changing the audio output in Xbox One back and forth is a pain. Welcome to my world, sir. Yep. So he tried bitstream output, both Dolby Digital and DTS. Both of these are in 5.1. Again, it's okay. You can play an up mixer, but he wants discrete 7.1 audio when the source has it. Then he tried setting the Xbox One to output bitstream Atmos. His mm -hmm. receiver kicked into Atmos mode, but the end result was the same as seven, setting the Xbox One to output 7.1 and press PCM, which we know is the case. Yeah. His surround backs are silent, and he can't apply an up mixer. What's even weirder is that you heard us talk about the problems playing 5.1 content on the Xbox One to output 7.1 uh, or Bitstream and how it plays the side surround channels out of the surround back speakers and leaves the side surrounds completely silent. He's seen lots of other people complaining about the exact same thing online too, but he hasn't had that particular problem with his, uh, his Onkyo. The side surround speakers play just fine for him, but he can't get anything to come out of a surround back speakers unless it's a blu-ray movie or a 7.1 game so what's the best thing to do i my my take on this is probably wrong but i hope it's, <laughs> i hope i hope i hope it's wrong i hope rob has a, a, a suggestion that's better than mine <laughs> i don't but know i my think take i on this... gave you the suggestion you might be about to say at one point okay <laughs> So what's the best he can, thing he could do? He's leaning towards just leaving the Xbox One sent to output 5.1 uncompressed PCM. Blu-ray movies still play in 7.1 just fine because there's a the second audio option for those discs that says let my receiver decode audio and everything else. Games and streaming content comes out as 5.1, which you get an up mix with his receiver. It's not perfect, discrete audio like he'd ideally like to have, but at least all seven of his speakers make sounds this way. It's a lot less of a pain not having to manually switch audio modes all the time. Do we agree with doing things this way? Why do you think this is happening? Why do you think no sound is coming out of the surround backs? Yeah. Well, I mean, with the streaming audio services, I don't know how many are actually delivering true 7.1. Although, I mean, if they labeled it as such, you would hope that, yes, you would hope, it's yeah. actually there. I, I wonder if the Xbox One maybe doesn't actually have a Dolby Digital Plus decoder or something. I'm like it's it's treating it like it's a 5.1 signal. I mean, because you if it's Dolby Digital, regular Dolby Digital, that can't carry 7.1 channels of audio. Can't do it. It's limited to 5.1. Uh, Dolby Digital Plus can carry actual discrete 7.1 audio. So I'm like, is this somehow taking the 7.1 Dolby Digital Plus audio stream from whatever service it is, like Voodoo? Voodoo would send out its 7.1 audio in Dolby Digital Plus. Uh, when they do so, there is like a traditional Dolby Digital 5.1 core. It's, it's not really yeah. the way Dolby encodes things, but if you sort of think of it that way, it gives you the right idea where it, so the idea is that it's always backwards compatible, right? If somebody only has a regular Dolby digital decoder, they'll still get audio from that Dolby digital plus stream. It's designed that way. So I'm like, it's almost as though the Xbox one either doesn't ha truly have a Dolby digital plus decoder, or it's a bad implementation where it's only taking the 5.1 core and using that, right. I, I don't know for Xbox sure. Xbox One but... has a bad implementation of audio. I can't believe that would be the case. <laughs> for Microsoft, they're such a huge company. Clearly, they should be able to get audio, right? That's like mm. the simplest thing. But I mean, he's absolutely right that if you leave the Xbox One set to output 7.1 uncompressed PCM, well, you can never use an up mixer because the receiver is saying, yes. I'm already getting 7.1 channels. Two of them happen to be silent, but you're sending me the channels so I can't, there's and nothing Atmos for me do the same thing. to up mix. Yeah. The Atmos implementation works the same way because it's actually decoding the audio first and then just putting it into an Atmos container and sending that out. So I, I'm actually confused why it's not coming out of the surround back since it's coming around out of the surround. And you know what? I've, I've seen people say it both ways. I've seen people say, whenever I play something in 5.1, but I've set my Xbox to output 7.1, the surround channels that should be coming out of the sides come out of the back. That's check. what happens to you. Yeah. But then I've heard other people say, no, for me, it works. The sides come out of the sides, but my backs are silent, uh, which is exactly I need to check it because I, I don't even know what mine is set on Doing anymore. anymore. I've given up on the Xbox. Yeah, so, I've kind of given up on it and just enjoyed my 2.0. This is now. why my... Yeah, that's exactly it. The, my suggestion... I, I mean, this is even crazier than setting it to 5.1 uncompressed PCM and using your up mixer. There are some streaming services that are still only sending their audio in stereo. 
They're only in two in two point oh stereo. E- even within Netflix, there are shows that will be in two point oh. That's right. Or and mono. Similarly, if you have set your Xbox to output five point one uncompressed. You can apply an up mixer, but what it's done is sent out those 5.1 discrete channels, but only two of them contain any audio information. So when you yeah. apply your up mixer to the 5.1, it still doesn't put any sound into your side surrounds from a stereo source because it's like, I already got a signal for what the side surround should be doing. It's silence. So <laughs> the only sound right. is coming out of the front left. Right? Let, so, let me let me spread that silence to the back speakers. To the, to the back speakers. So the crazy way that, I mean, this is the way I continue to use my Xbox One. So first of all, using it as a, like a Blu-ray player for physical Blu-ray discs. Yep, it's got that separate setting that says let my receiver decode audio and that works just fine. But for everything else, I leave it set to output 2.0 stereo (laughs) because all the sound is there, right? Even if it's a discrete 7.1 game, all of the sound is down mixed and put into two channels. Those two channels are now set out, sent out to my AV receiver, and I let my receiver use its up mixer to put that sound, that stereo sound, into all of my speakers, and it never fails. I mean, is it truly discrete audio? Obviously not anymore, but it never fails to give me all the sound, and my up mixer makes all of my speakers actually make noises. I think that you shouldn't do that. Uh, I mean, the fair the reason enough. Being, it, it, the reason being is that I, I think what he cares about more is games and games, five point yes. one movies and stuff. Possibly, so yeah. stereo. It, so if he's watching a stereo source and it just comes out stereo, mm-hmm. I think he's not. I he's mean, probably that's okay not with that. Be, I think he'd be okay with that. It, yeah, that's fair enough. Take, but what Rob's saying. Okay, so think of it this way: the the receiver or the the initial signal it's got this this discrete sound Mm -hmm. and you know it down mixes it to to, to 2.0 it doesn't just collapse it it down mixes it which means that there's some phase things going on here that which are indicators to you as the listener where the sound's supposed to be coming from well that's also an indicator to the receiver Mm -hmm. what speaker it could be coming out of Mm -hmm. so that spreading around is not happenstance and not random it is oh here's some phase differences here this probably means that this sound should be coming out of the surround or the surround back speaker i'm going to spread this stuff around with my dolby surround up mixer therefore you know i'll put that sound back there Mm -hmm. so it's not like by down mixing it and taking stereo that you know it's just going to randomly put sounds in places it's not there's a there's a thoughtful you know, algorithm yeah. that looks at the sound and tries to place it where it's supposed it to be. It does a pretty good job, if dude. You, it does. Yeah. And if you have that five, if you already have 5.1, well, it, all it's doing is looking at the surround speakers and saying, what if, what is this is actually supposed to be coming from behind? Mm-hmm. And is it supposed to be coming out from a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left? And then it uses those speakers, which is a lot, quote unquote, easier than doing that with a two channel source. But I think you would be okay either way. I think that you would feel better as a listener to do it in 5.1 and just not worry about, you know, old episodes of The Simpsons being in stereo. Yeah, that's, that's oh, that's, I'm, uh, that's it's me. totally fair enough. I think if you stick with the plan that you've got right now of just leaving it in 5.1 uncompressed, so everything comes out as 5.1 uncompressed uh, PCM and yes things that are discrete 7.1 are not being sent out as discrete 7.1 you're using an up mixer to actually make your surround backs come alive but that information that would have been in the two surround back speakers is now only being down mixed into your stair uh, into your side surround channels in that yeah. 5.1 uncompressed and it's pretty easy to matrix that back out into your surround back mm. speakers so yep I, I agree Tom's reasoning is perfectly sound for me I care even less and I want all my speakers to be making sound even when it's a stereo source well you have so and I have so have many other ways of streaming you also have to consider yeah yeah <laughs> yeah uh I think I used to have for a while. I did five point one, and then mm-hmm. I, or seven point one, and I was only getting sur- sa- uh, side surround information on my s- surround back speakers. Right. So I changed it to five point one for yeah. a while, and then I changed it to two point oh or whatever. Yeah, stereo. But then I I got the better version of Netflix, so I got Atmos. Right. 
so I think I then changed it to ah, Atmos so that yes. I would get actual Atmos when I'm watching Atmos, right. which means it screws up everything else. But I really only I cared more about get, making sure I got discrete Atmos than I did about everything else. Fair enough. I think that's what I ended up doing. Ryan. Ryan is back with more questions about his basement home theater build where he currently has the ceiling exposed. Okay. We said to put the Atmos speakers five feet in front and five feet behind, but in front of his seats, he has an HVAC duct right at that distance, so he could either put the top front speakers three feet in front of his seats or six foot eight inches. Then for his top rear speakers, in order to keep the right top rear speaker two feet away from the door on the partial back wall, he had a, had a rough in plan for it to only be two and a half feet behind the seats, but he could move it back another 16 inches. What would we recommend? Uh, bug. So, I mean, uh, I think maybe where I'll start um, speaking about this is just to note for you that, uh, so it's all back to angles, right? When it comes to the, the right. recommended locations, it's all about elevation angles. And, I mean, it looks like, um, I don't know if this is a full eight foot ceiling. You know, if it doesn't look like judging it. by how I mean, much. Look at the door. Yeah. That door I mean, that's that, six feet eight, that, right? That door. It's a standard doorway, so that's six feet eight. It doesn't look like this is a full eight feet to that door, so I'm going to yeah. low uh, estimate maybe this is a seven and a half foot tall ceiling. It might even be lower than that, but I'm just going to estimate this is a seven and a half foot tall ceiling. So normally we say you've probably got when you're sitting down in a standard eight foot ceiling about five feet from your ears to the ceiling. And right. since the recommended elevation angle for uh, top front and top rear speakers is 45 degrees, well, that's really simple math because if you've got five feet from your ears to the ceiling, then a 45 degree elevation angle would be five feet in front of you and five feet behind you. Now, if right. your ceiling is more like seven and a half feet, well, now you're four and a half feet from your ears to the mm -hmm. ceiling. So 45 degree elevation angle would be four and a half feet in front of you and four and a half feet behind you. But those are not the only acceptable angles for top front and top rear that's speakers. That's just smack dab in the middle of the, of the yeah, range. Yeah, that's just the, the, you know, the number one uh, ideal location if you can, but it's anywhere from a 30 degree elevation angle in front of you to a 55 degree elevation angle. So if, um, hmm. we're talking about this certainly looks like it's not an eight foot ceiling. I'm going to estimate that it's four and a half feet from your ears to your ceiling. Then th within the recommended angles, they could be anywhere from 3.15 feet, basically three feet in front of you to 7.8 feet behind you. Those would be the recommended distances based on the angles and based on what looks to be a little bit lowered ceiling height. So... The three feet in front of you for your top fronts would be totally acceptable, but the six feet eight inches would also be totally acceptable. That's less than 7.8 feet, which is within the recommended range. Right. To me, you'll probably, I would guess most people who are starting with Atmos would probably prefer to go with the three feet in front of you because it's a little bit easier to notice. Right, it's closer to being yeah. uh, directly overhead. When they're quite far in front of you and overhead, it's much more diffuse, and you don't notice it nearly as much. So I'm guessing you'll prefer the three feet. But for the top rears, I would probably recommend moving it back a bit because only two and a half feet behind you is kind of a no man's land. It's like not really where top rears should be. It's too close, and it's not really where top middle should be. It's a little bit too far back for top middles. So if you can right. move your top rear speakers back, now you're within that, you know, slightly more than three feet range, exactly where it'd be recommended. So we're basically saying three feet in front of you, three feet behind you, more or less, uh, I think would work quite nicely. Sure. Yeah. It, you know, and it, like, like you said, it's anywhere in this range. So That's right. If you know, you just want both the front speakers to be in line with each other, and both the back speakers to be in line with each other. The That's front right. ones are a little bit further f forward than, than the four feet or the five feet or whatever. That's fine. If the back speakers are also yeah. further behind. That's also fine. But, you know, having them close makes a little bit more sense to me as well. Are Am I breaking up for you? Because you are breaking up like crazy. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. You've been, uh, your video has been pausing many, many times. So, uh, our Skype nah, connection I'm, is not I'm stellar. I'm hardwired in, so I don't know what the deal is. I don't know. No, it is not. 
<laughs> Those of you watching this on YouTube, feel free to check us out on the whatever video. I guess our other video is going to look the same. Well, the video is going to look the same, but the oh, audio yeah. will be cleaned up. Yes. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right. For his four in ceiling Atmos speakers, who's playing on the go with Mica M8Cs. Uh, we missed a question 40... there. Sorry. Uh, we didn't talk Did about his uh, oh, touch okay, speakers yet. Yeah. I just was scrolling through pictures. Yeah. He already owns Clips Reference 2 Series Towers and Center for his front three speakers. He has pretty firm plans to use uh, in-wall Clips speakers for his side surrounds, which he has rough and planned to go directly to each side. But since he only has a partial block wall, uh, sorry, a partial back wall, and the room extends way back on the left-hand side, he was planning to use wall mounts for a pair of surround back speakers, which would be four feet away from his side surrounds. Anything we would change about that? I don't love using surround back speakers in here at all <laughs> i a I, door right I knew behind you would say that there is there is a door right behind him to you know over to his right hand side uh so he's basically putting one surround yeah. back speaker in his rear right corner which does exist and then equaling yeah. that on the left hand side um but he basically doesn't have uh yeah well there there is a back wall on his left hand side but it's way back there so he's more or less mounting yeah. these surround back it's, speakers it, on his he's side he's only got rows. one one row of seats though right he's only got one row of seats yeah and I, furthermore just, just, coming I up mean, later not to yeah. spoil it ahead of time but i'm going to be suggesting he actually move his seat forward without necessarily moving where his surround speakers are planned to be installed um, so I might be in favor, uh, with this. I'm, I'm a bigger fan of surround back speakers than Tom is, but in this instance, uh, those are not ideally positioned surround back speakers. Not, not at all. all. They, yeah. they are too far yeah. apart. Uh, they aren't truly giving you that I'm right behind you effect. You're going to have top rear speakers. Um, so there's no way that I'd be putting your surround backs in the yeah. ceiling or something like that. That would make no sense. And I'm going to actually recommend you end up with your side surround speakers in a position that is a bit behind your seat as opposed to directly to the sides. And I think that'll give you a pretty darn good effect. Yeah, I don't really see any reason to try to put surround backs in this. Yeah, because I mean, there's nowhere theater. else I mean, to... There's just too many... There's nowhere else to put them and they're yeah. way too far apart they're like basically yeah. on the wall for you know three or four feet behind where he's planning on putting the surround speakers yeah. which angle wise to your ear to the back of your head is not that many degrees difference i mean it's really quite i mean close. they're a second set of side surrounds is what they are they aren't really surround backs in this what they are. orientation yeah, yeah. So again, we'll try it again. For his four in ceiling Atmos speakers, you plan to go with the Mica M8Cs because they're only 40 bucks, as opposed to the much more expensive Klipsch in ceiling models. He figures if he really wants to, he could upgrade them in the future. At some point, you won't. You won't do that. No one, <laughs> no one ever opens their ceiling up twice. So we think that they'll be okay for the time being to get him started. I, I don't think that you'll ever upgrade them. So you buy, you buy what you want now, or you don't buy it i mean in um, ceilings that I are would, of the same diameter it's not too hard to replace if if you were to try these and be like yeah, oh, these just he, totally don't cut it but i yeah. think they'll be fine <laughs> well okay so one of the things i worry about with matching clips with non clip speakers or non horn loaded speakers are uh, uh ma you know uh level matching issues sure where your clip speakers you they take very little power to get very very loud and then the other speakers might take a lot of power to get very very loud well if you're really only going to be sitting about four feet away from these things and it, they'll get plenty loud without an issue so if you really think that you'll upgrade someday mm. you buy the speakers knowing that what would be the clip speaker that you would put there in, in sure. instead and make sure it's the same it's either the same size hole or or the clipses are bigger yeah yeah well even if they're bigger i mean it depends on how he mounts them if he mounts them right up against a, a oh yeah a stud a, or something yeah, yeah true a, enough a stud or something you know you won't be able to just expand the hole you'll have to like offset the hole and then you know what i mean it yeah. ends up being much more of a deal so you know be careful about that you know make sure that if you're really going to you have a very clear very delineated very well thought out plan 
for how you're going to switch these speakers out. But uh, so honestly, on... I, I, I think I think you yeah, are right. okay. I think you're okay going with that plan. Uh, we've said over and over again how your your Atmos speakers, as long as they aren't utter garbage, are probably absolutely fine for the duties of playing the Atmos sounds. And uh, the mic yeah. is good enough, certainly for a start. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. These are not <laughs> utter garbage, so they'll be fine. That's right. So he's planning on having his seat inside surround speakers 13 feet from the front wall. He likes the low price point of a fixed frame silver ticket screen. And as we pointed out last time, going with the slightly smaller 120 versus the 135 will give him enough space on either side and below the screen to position his front three clip speakers quite nicely. So that's what he has in mind for a screen in the seating distance. He looked at the two projectors we recommended most highly. The Epson Home Cinema 4010 and the BenQ HT3550. He's not a gamer. So the longer input latency of the BenQ doesn't matter to him. The BenQ is cheaper and has full 18 gigabits per second HDMI inputs. So is there really any reason to pay more for the Epson uh, 4010? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's there there do exist better. reasons I can give justification if you're the type of person who is like, I kind of want to get the 4010. Is there any way I can justify it? It's like, yeah, it, it, it is incrementally better in a number of ways. But that doesn't mean that the starting, if you consider the BenQ HD 3550 as the starting point, that that's somehow bad. It's like, no, it's a really nice, solid, good looking projector. If you haven't been watching a projector this whole time, you're gonna be blown away by the image quality for $1,500 that the HD 3550 gives you. It's if you right. put it side by side and critically analyze it next to the 4010, the 4010 is incrementally better in some ways. That's really all it is so honestly if it's the money matters more at this point i have no problem recommending the 3550 to you because it's a really good looking projector so go for it um this is a point where I'll, I'll mention that um you know you're talking about 120 inch screen i think that's the right choice you know for for all those reasons yeah. that you listed if you sit 13 feet away from that, as you have, you know, roughed in planned, uh, that's going to put you at 37 degrees as your field of view, which for me is a little bit smaller than I would love to have for a projection setup. I'm like, going projector, I want that cinematic experience, which for me, I'd be sitting about 11 feet away from a 120 inch screen, uh, which I think you can entirely do. I don't think you need to move your side surround speakers, but this might impact where you end up putting your top fronts and top rears. And the nice right. thing here is, if you end up moving your seat two feet forward from where you've got the seat planned right now, well now you don't need to move your top rear speakers back because they were going to be two and a half feet behind you, now they're gonna be four and a half feet behind you. That sounds really good. and. You were saying that the top front speakers either need to be three feet in front of you or six and a half feet in front of you. Well, now uh, they'd only be one foot in front of you if you've moved your seat two feet forward or four and a half feet in front of you. So all of a sudden, your top front and top rear speakers are exactly where you would want them to be. Your ceiling is about four feet and a half, four and a half feet uh, above you, and now your top front is four and a half feet in front of you, and your top rear is four and a half feet behind you. Yeah, I mean. It's going to be pretty close. Yeah, we are estimating, but it's going to be something pretty close yeah. to that. This solves so many possible little issues without changing your plans to something that doesn't work for you. We're now saying, okay, the top fronts are going to go in front of that heating duct. The top rears are going to go exactly where you had planned. Your side surrounds are going to go exactly where you had planned, but you're just going to move your seat two feet forward, going to give you the nicer, bigger field of view with the 120-inch screen, and everything else falls into place, and you don't need surround back speakers anymore. It's all solved. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless you absolutely positively know that you want a 37 degree field of view, right? Unless you've you've measured it out at a home th at a at a cinema, you know exactly what you're looking for as far as, uh, and you don't want to be any closer to that. Then Rob's problem. I, I 37 is fine, but it's it's fine. Not quite big enough <laughs> you, know, right. you want to be a little bit closer than that so like a guy who's 37 like i would accept if it's like well i inch screen. yeah 37 is the type of thing i would accept if like i can afford a 75 inch flat panel and i have to sit you know the distance away that equals a 37 degree i'm like yeah i can live with that but if i'm going projector right. i'd want bigger 
So given uh, where he wants to position his equipment at the very back of that extended section of the rear wall, he's going to need a very long HDMI cable upwards of 50 feet. I'm not sure why he would need something that long. That, that this room, there's no way this room is that long. Uh, I don't know. It must be something there, to do asks, with the way is there he's any passive... loading it. Yeah. I, don't I don't know, know why. Is there any passive HDMI cable that will do, do uh, that will do at that length? Does he need an active HDMI cable fiber optic? Well, is it a 50 foot long room? Is that what you're thinking? Or, I, you know, is it going to have to be rallied around a bunch of stuff? Because your projector is not going to be all the way at the front of your room. Maybe it's, it's actually in another behind your seats. Maybe it's actually in another room in this basement. I'm not really sure. I just, I'm going to take it He's... as wrote that it's going to be 50 feet long. I'm not entirely sure why, but let's just say that it is. Uh, you definitely don't want to use a passive HDMI cable. It's not going to do it. Um, 50... Well, I mean, 50 foot, 50 foot passive can work for 1080p and other things right but, but uh, he's... if we're if you're if you're going to get this ben q with That's the right. full 18 gigabits and everything like that you're going to need active it's just yeah. not it's going to fail yeah i mean it's just not going to pass through the full bandwidth and that you're looking 50 for. feet is basically the upper limit of active uh beyond 50 feet i probably would recommend going fiber optic but 50 feet active will be fine Spend the little bit extra money. We just gave you reason that you don't have to spend any money on surround back speakers. Put that towards a really good active HDMI cable. Get the one from Blue Jeans. I'm I'm kind of begging you to do that. Uh, get Blue Jeans active HDMI cable, the 50 foot length, and that'll serve you well. And put it in a conduit like we said last time. The BenQ has a 1.3 times zoom lens range. Does that affect the image quality at all? Would having the projector closer to the screen improve the image in any way versus the longest possible distance? Well, you can run into problems with brightness if you are at the longest possible distance. But, but if this you're is only a the 1.3 range times. that tells you. Yeah. yeah. If you're, I mean, first of all, an optical zoom is, I don't see any issues with this. Is, it, it, really, I'm more worried about how bright it's going to be, how much light output is going to actually reach the screen. That having a little bit of zoom shouldn't make that much of a difference. But uh, the only thing you could run, really run into is just uh, you know a, a brightness issue. But I would, as long as you're within the recommended, hey, you, if you want a 120 inch screen, go between this and this, you'll be fine. Yeah, with projectors that have really long zoom uh, ranges. Um, it does tend to be the case that if you have the projector as close as it can possibly be versus as far away as it can possibly be, that when it's farther away, it is dimmer. I mean, that's just a normal thing that we would expect to happen. Um, but when it's only a right. 1.3 times zoom, it, that's not enough zoom to make a really noticeable difference. Uh, the other thing is the closer you put the projector, the steeper the angle the light is hitting the sides of the screen, right? You've moved the projector closer, so that's a a wider angle and a steeper angle up and down that the light is hitting the screen, which means more of the light is reflecting off to the sides and up and down. So generally, uh, things look more uniform on the screen if you have the projector as far back as you can put it. That's a narrower cone of light, less steep angles hitting the screen, more of that light coming back towards your eyes as opposed to reflecting off at an angle. <clears throat> but again, with 1.3 times, not really going to make a huge difference either way. Right. Mike, we've recommended uh, Yamaha's MusicCast system as a whole house audio solution to Mike a little while ago. He went with the Avantage RX A3080 flagship for his theater. He also went with our suggestion for the Yamaha Bar 400 sound bar for his master bedroom. It works very nicely, but it turns out the room is quite large. Uh, which one is bedroom? About yes. 24 by 24, and his TV and the sound bar are about 17 feet away when he's watching from his bed. Yep. So the bar 400 isn't quite up to the task. I wouldn't have thought so. <laughs> 17 feet away. Indeed. Holy moly. Yes. He's going to... So he's going to use it in a different, smaller bedroom, but for the master bedroom, he needs more output. Holy moly. Yep, you fair are enough. way far away from this thing. That's a big old master so, bedroom. I know. It sounds ridiculous. Yeah, he's got a big master bedroom for sure, but on top of that, he it looks like he's like in the back left and then the TV's in the f no, he's in the back right and the TV's in the front left corner almost. <laughs> so, he, he's going he's going diagonal across this That's, room. So, yep. yeah, That's I can right. imagine hearing things would be an issue. 
Uh, his 85-inch TV is mounted on a side wall using an, an articulated mount so that can face the bed. He still wants a sound bar or speakers that can hang below the TV and move along with it. He's thinking there probably isn't an actual sound bar that will get the job done. So perhaps one of those passive speaker bars where it's three speakers that just happen to share one long cabinet. He isn't worried about having 5.1 surround sound. Just have, I hope not, yeah. Just having the front three channels would be fine. And he wants a subwoofer, but he isn't looking to pressurize his master bedroom. Just something to nicely blend with the speakers and fill in the low notes he's thinking it's 24 by 24 by 8 <laughs> <laughs> oh can you put it right next to your bed because that's what you're gonna have to do unless you don't Maybe. want to pressurize this room yeah. he's thinking a fairly basic yamaha receiver so that he can still connect to music cast and then a passive speaker bar with sufficient output capabilities and a sub that will just blend nicely he can spend as much as 3500 bucks what do we recommend well, yeah, you could do that. Uh, yep. You could definitely do a small, uh, you know, like a, a an entry level ish, whatever the entry level is that still accepts music cast and all that stuff. Uh, Yamaha receiver, some like, I mean, if you don't care about how they look, you could get the uh, HSU the shoe little bookshelf horn loaded speakers. Oh, I guess you could do those. Those would be loud. Uh, or something <laughs> they like would. that. How easy they would be to mount, like hanging below an articulated mounted yeah. TV, though. I'm not super into that. Um, uh, I don't know. But I'm, I mean, I'm, just, along, I'm just thinking, yeah. Yeah, along these same lines, I am thinking horn loaded, I am thinking efficient, and I'm thinking Klipsch, not surprisingly, who uh, last week right. I mentioned how they have their reference premiere on wall speakers. Well, one of the models they offer is one of these speaker bars where it's three of those reference premiere on wall speakers that happen to share one long cabinet, which would be pretty slick looking for one and then also nice and easy to mount on what you get you know those l brackets that just hang down from the actual visa tv mount yeah those l brackets that hang down comes with a bracket that you would attach right onto that and it would all secure quite easily and nicely to your existing tv mount so in all of those ways klipsch's uh what is the model number here it's the rp 440 d and it goes for $800, so certainly not breaking the bank. It's 92 dB efficient and can take 400 watts if you really, really want it to. It can play loud. I mean, louder than just right. about any sound. I mean, I suppose I could mention that insane Sennheiser sound bar, which I think is about $3,500. Right. It's also so enormous, I wouldn't trust it hanging below a TV mount. It is Right. It's. I mean, they call it a soundbar, but it's absolute well, insanity. So I would rather go with this Klipsch. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that, and this makes a lot of sense. But there's also like the Yamaha uh, digital projectors, the sound pr projectors. Yeah, things. but is but those loud are, really? They're forte. I, I, they just have so many drivers in them that and they can do know, the so beam forming thing that go around. Yeah, the beam forming yeah, thing where it I, aims it right at you. And you That's can. True. You can set those things so that they are either you know trying to do you know bounce around your room surround mm -hmm. sound, uh, phase surround sound, or no surround sound. Yeah, well, they they, they do have the thing where they they use all those drivers to direct the sound right at yeah. you. Um, that's true. Yeah, though, I I don't know how those work with music cast because I've kind of not paid attention to mm. them in recent years. Mm. But they those by themselves are basically a receiver and a sound bar all true. together. Yeah. You know, they do all of their own processing. Yeah. So that would, but, and they usually end up costing a couple of grand anyway. So you would not need. Yeah. Cause the, you, you'd the definitely be going for the, the big one that has the like 68 drivers or whatever it is. That's all packed into there. You'd yeah. want to go for the, for the big one. Again, yeah. I don't even know if you can hang that from, from the bottom of a TV. <laughs> that's the thing <laughs> really again. I mean, this, to. this clip is pretty lightweight. It's, it's, it's definitely meant yeah. to be wall mounted. No question. And will easily mount below the TV. I, it, I mean, it's very efficient and can accept a good tons of power if you wanted to. So the output, I'm not concerned about the clips. That's, that's why right. I'm pretty okay with that. Now, pairing it up with a Yamaha receiver, absolutely. Um, I would suggest to you, on the outside chance that you ever decide, maybe I will add, you know, surround speakers, going with one of the current model year models, uh, if you're in the RX-V series, it'll end in a 5. If you're in the RX-A series, it'll end with an 80 
an 8-0. Uh, going with the current model year lets you do that thing where you could use a pair of Music Cast 20 speakers as wireless surrounds if you ever wanted to. So it's kind of like, why not? They're available at Accessories for Less now at lovely discounted prices. Um, I'd probably go for the top of the line RXV, which is the 685. That gives you a nice 90 watts per channel. It's only $400. In fact, I think it's 380 over at Accessories for Less. So certainly not breaking the bank. And it actually has front, left, right pre-outs. Uh, it doesn't have a pre-out for the center. But if the receiver is only powering the center channel, <laughs> and for some reason you need even more amplifier power, because like I say, that Clips Reference Premiere thing can take 400 watts if you really want it to. Uh, you have the option of adding external amps for the front left, right channels. Um, that 685 actually has like a sister model in the RX A series, which is the 780. They're like identical feature wise. Um, so the only thing to maybe upgrade there would be to go up to the Avantage 880, uh, which is $580 over accessories for less, because that gives you a full set of pre outs. If you're like, I really don't trust that this receiver can power just the center speaker all by itself, uh, full set of pre outs comes with the 880. Subwoofer, though, what are we going to do there, Tom? Well, if you're gonna put it close, if you if you're not gonna put it close to your bed, mm. you're regardless of whether or not you want to pressurize your room, you're gonna have to pressurize your room right. to really have the experience that you're looking for. So, if you can put it close to your bed, then you can go with something smaller, like a you know, like the one of the sealed boxes from SVS. Yeah, I was which, thinking like unfortunately, a, you know, like a two thousand. I mean, I, I wouldn't go one thousand series in here. Um, I'd go like an SB two thousand. Yeah, but. It still has to be close. It still has to be close, but, just, I, you know, I, I'd, yeah. I'd be, like, okay with an SB2000 here that's beside the bed. I think that could do the job. It's $700. So, I mean, if you total up all the prices, you know, $800 for the Klipsch, uh, $700 for the SB2000, and then even let's go for the, you know, $600, basically the 880 or something like that, you're well under the $3,500 you were willing to spend. Um, but, I mean, right. if this sub is going to be somewhere across the room, maybe a cylinder... Maybe the PC two thousand. I feel pretty comfortable with that. If, if yes, that's what you'd have to. You'd have to go with a cylinder if you're yeah. gonna. If, if at least in my mind, if you're going to go across the room from yourself, because yeah, that gives you the 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 output that you'd really be looking for. Um, and a form factor that yeah, doesn't have to look crazy inside of a bedroom. I like the cylinders. Right. They're soft and round. They are soft and round. Your wife can throw her laundry on top of it, or you can throw your laundry on top of it. I don't care. Put the plan up there. Watch it vibrate off. Mike, last week we talked about Kevin A's situation where he was forced to replace his dead-end 4520 with the power, uh, Pioneer Elite receiver, and Kevin was thinking the Pioneer was weak because it kept shutting down and going to protection mode. At the very end of our discussion, did Rob really say to run MCACC? Have we ever heard the system post to MCACC? Mike thinks anything that has had MCACC applied sounds awful. We talk about Odyssey all the time and sometimes Drac, but Mike says he sometimes gets us to recommend those systems sometimes. What? But MCACC, really? If we actually recommend that, it might make him have to carefully consider our taste when he's listening to our recommendations. So do you actually hear that idea? It just misunderstands it. Dude, if you don't want to listen to us, no one's making you do this. All right, let's just start. No, he's that. not taking it that way. Don't you take know. super offense, Tom. He's he's ribbon, ribbon. I'm just saying. I mean, no one's no one's forcing you to be here, dude. But um, I don't remember us saying that. But the reality is, is any any system, even the garbage one that was on Onkyo last year, I think they've improved this year. <laughs> uh, will set up your speakers just fine, <laughs> and that's normally what we're going with. Yeah, I mean, to, to, you can to go ahead and run it and it will send up the speakers. Right. I mean, to be completely this, this clear stuff. on what I was suggesting there, uh, this was when he was talking about potentially using um, his Denon just as a dumb amplifier, uh, which we ultimately said he, he mm -hmm. shouldn't need to do. But if he goes ahead and does that anyway, we were talking about the setup process of making sure that the trim levels are set appropriately because... You know, you're no longer using the built-in amps of the Pioneer. You've now connected to an external amplifier. So I was saying, you know, you just run the MCACC because that allows it to set the trim levels for you, and it'll do a perfectly reasonable and fine job of that. So 
That's essentially what I was saying for if you hate the results of the equalization that it applies, well, then you just turn off MCACC after having run it. But the running it is to set the distances and the trim levels. Uh, I didn't make that explicitly clear, but that's why I was saying to run the auto setup. Now, uh, I have heard systems post MCACC like every other auto EQ system, I consider it just the potential cherry on top. It is not going to fix a bad room. It is not going to fix bad speakers. Uh, this is if you've already set up everything really nicely and already addressed your room's acoustics, it might be able to give you slightly more linear response uh, by applying some EQ. Uh, would I use this in a bad room and expect its auto EQ to make a world of difference that improves the sound? Absolutely not. Uh, but I wouldn't expect that from any equalization system. That said, MCACC has certainly never been my favorite out of the auto EQ systems. <laughs> I've never thought it does a fantastic job that I want everyone to rush out and buy. Uh, so there you go. That's more or less where I fall on that. Yeah, I used MCACC before Odyssey was really a thing. And then I felt like it was either, and this was a long time ago, so you can't really hold me to this because uh, it doesn't apply to today's stuff. But uh, I felt like it either did very little or did, n you know, a, a negative. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> so <Yep. laughs> I, 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 I kind of stayed away from it. But. You know, I got no problems with people using it. Some people love it, and that's fine. All right, let me get back to the questions because I was trying to find a sound bar for this dude at in the Yamaha thing, and oh. I'm, I'm not really seeing anything here. I clicked on the stuff that's right. supposed to be good, and it's all got four four tweeters and two woofers. I'm like, that's not enough. Well, just so you know, your Skype video is essentially dead for me over here. I'm still hearing your audio. Oh, I haven't been. Able I haven't been able to hear half of what you've said. Yep. I've just nodded a Fantastic lot. Fantastic so connection. Been... <laughs> Thank you, Skype. Microsoft killing it again. Microsoft PlayStation 5. 6. Mm -hmm. Microsoft PlayStation 6. Can't wait. Mike, last week we talked about Kevin A's situation. Wait a second. We just did that, did that one. one. <laughs> Infinite Gary. Last week when we were talking about OLEDs and mentioning, uh, briefly mentioned micro LED modular displays, Tom said something about looking forward to projectors eventually being replaced or that's where projectors will end up going, something along those lines. Do we actually think there will ever come a time we no longer use projectors throwing light onto a screen? Even today, aside from just sheer size, there's something different about the way a projected image looks versus a mess of display. So could projection survive not just because of size and price, but because of the unique way it looks? No. <laughs> that is my wholehearted response to that emissive displays in my opinion t look better than uh the same quality projection displays black mm. levels can be better just objectively true uh you know, so like you're, if you're less worried about ambient light wall... in the room right if big wall-sized um, displays become affordable. I mean, that's a lot of ifs, right? We know the big wall size displays with these modular panels is going to be possible on a technical level, but as far as it becoming affordable, that's, that's a big caveat. But if it does, then the notion that people will opt for a projection setup at that point, if the projection setup is not significantly cheaper, right? If we're saying that the price right. is comparable and it's just a matter of are you going to opt for a projection or a modular display that can cover your whole wall? I mean, just look at commercial movie theaters, all right? Obviously, this whole time we've been using projection setups in commercial movie theaters because there was literally no alternative, right? That's the only way you can make an image that size of a commercial movie theater screen. But now that the commercial version of Samsung's The Wall and Sony's uh, Crystal LED display are becoming available, some theaters are choosing to install them. They're way more expensive than their projection setup, yeah. but they're like, look what we can do. We can have a cinema-sized, self-emissive display that is way brighter, the contrast is way higher, and this is something we can use to draw new audiences to our venue. We, it's Even though it's way more expensive, we think it's worth it because people are like, whoa, look at that screen. I've never seen a commercial movie theater that looks like that. So 
if it can get down to the same price at some point, and yeah, projection is dead. <laughs> projection is projection is such a pain to deal with. <laughs> you know, you have to have line of sight from the back of the room or some you know something hanging down from your ceiling in the middle of your room to, mm -hmm. to the screen. You know, you got to deal with you know bulbs and everything else. No. No, <laughs> I, I wish projection was dead right now. <laughs> I, I like it because of the size and I like it because of the cost. Right. But I want a if I could replace the screen in here mm. with a 92 or 90 inch or 100 inch admissive display, I would do it right now. I do it. I, I you would you would you'd find my projector on the freaking corner with a brand new bulb that I just bought. There you <laughs> go, Gary. Because my bulb. <laughs> So we've been talking a bit about OLED and LCD factories lately, and we've mentioned mother glass and how more than one screen size might be cut from one sheet of mother glass. For example, LG Display has talked about how their new OLED factory in China lets them make sheets of mother glass that allow them to cut a couple of 77-inch panels and a few 48-inch panels from one sheet. But both of those screen sizes are still 4K resolution, so the pixels in the 48-inch panels must be smaller and closer together, right? Or in the case of making 8K TVs, uh, Gary assumes the manufacturers like Samsung and LG are still using the same mother glass, right? But they're somehow uh, making the, eight, the, the display displays 8K resolutions to the 4K. So how does all that work? The same mother glass but different resolutions and different screen sizes. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah it's i mean it's a really interesting thing to think about um it, it's pretty complex and there are different manufacturing methods and i am not an expert in any of them so please do not take uh the sort of general things that i'm about to say as like the absolute truth on this this is a real wide overview from someone who doesn't fully understand it but the parts that I do understand, uh, largely what they're doing right now with like quantum dot displays, uh, it's what they call colloidal chemistry, which is just you actually suspend something in, um, you know, kind of a fluid and that gets injected into something and it spreads itself out evenly. That's what they're doing with like quantum mm. dots. So they get these layers and they inject it in there and how densely they pack the quantum dots relates to how small and close together the pixels are in that type of display. Uh, in OLEDs, they're using an evaporative process. So again, they're coating the mother glass with a layer of the things that will eventually turn into the OLED subpixels, and then they evaporate the liquid away from it and those things are now deposited onto that mother glass. Again, depending on the density that they, you know, injected that originally liquid form into it. Um, there's also methods where they're like literally picking and placing individual little subpixels on there with tiny little microscopic sized tweezers, essentially. That's how micro LEDs are put together at this point. Uh, and then there are other systems where things get etched. Um, some of the older LCD technologies were that way. They, they would etch the pattern on there. Uh, so yeah, all of these different methods mean that you can set up a certain section of this large piece of mother glass that you've created. Um, you just alter the density of the liquid that either you're either evaporating or spreading, or you uh, more tightly space the etching or uh, you use an inkjet printer to actually deposit things where you want them, or these tiny little microscopic squeezers to uh, tweezers to pick in place. So that's how they can do it. You're starting with this one big substrate, and then you section off portions right. of it and do these things. And the issue is, in order to have a 90-inch admissive display, you have to start with glass that's that big. And nobody has glass that's that big. Therefore, right. you know the maximum you can do is, a, is this... The, the the width maximum basically of the the glass that comes off or the usable glass that comes mm -hmm. off a lot of times when you're when you're rolling out glass or you know because uh, i used to work at a glass plant my dad used to work at the automotive industrial uh he was a glass plant when i was a kid so i worked there one summer and this this glass comes rolling off of the of the line and the ends of it are always not usable you usually that's right. cut those off and you know get it to the right size so that's the maximum height if you mm -hmm. think of it that way, height of the screen, since the screens are wider than they are. So no matter what, you cannot go unless you're going to start printing out, you know, 2.35 to 1 <laughs> screens. Yeah. God help us. Uh, yeah, but as long as it's 16 by 9, the height is that's, cause that's as big as it can get. So when they're saying, oh, we've got a, you know, we're making a new plant with a, you know, glass that can put out 77 inches. Well, what they're saying is the glass that comes off, it can come off at the right quality so that we can have a 77 inch diagonal screen mm -hmm. that comes off there 
and then we can also cut it into something smaller and if we want to and they, they have definitely talked about how you know through refi uh, refinement of the manufacturing process like if you're talking about taking one big sheet of glass and turning it into uh, six or seven individual smaller displays within there well there's some gap in between each of those right and there the there's the edges of yeah. that original thing like Tom says those parts become unusable and through refinements they're able to start making uh, you know the gaps between each uh, panel that they cut well, they can cut that more precisely and have less waste material. Uh, the edges can, uh, you know, they can cut closer to the edge so that there's less waste material. That's why instead of a 75 inch, now it's a 77 inch. You know, they refined it and managed to squeeze another two inches out of there. It's that type of thing that's going on. Yeah. And a lot of that time, that waste just ends up getting crushed and thrown right back in. And yeah, recycled. Yeah. Into the, the it's they just melt it right back down and put it back through. Um, I don't know it, it, with OLEDs and some of these other things if there's impurities that they're introduced when mm. during it that is part of the process so they can't reuse it. But generally speaking, like with automotive and um, industrial glass, if something came off it wasn't right, they would just crush it and throw it back into the thing and say, "Try again, dude." <laughs> Lee, Lee Overstreet are. I guess we'll probably be here next week. Leah, it's Possibly. been pointed out that no theater in uh, North America is able to play back Ang Lee's Gemini Man the way it was actually shot and finished in 3D, 4K resolution at 120 frames per second. It says 14 Dolby Cinemas uh, can show it in 3D at 120 uh, frames per second, but only 2K resolution. The, and quite a few theaters, including IMAX, can show it in 3D at 4K, but only at 60 frames per second. And then, of course, the home release on Ultra HD Blu-ray won't have 3D and will be limited to 60 frames per second because, of course, That's the format. So what are our thoughts about using a format that essentially no one can actually experience and having no way of showing the movie as it was intended at home? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Make your movie however you... Whatever floats your boat. And then, you know, <laughs> you buy yourself the specialized equipment it takes to so you can be the only one that watches it i bet that guy's got the ceiling all of his speakers with his stupid <laughs> lifeguard chair i bet i bet he's he can watch it at 120 frames per second 4k 3d i bet he i can mean do it. there are he some won't. there are some theaters not in north america in other parts of the world like south korea uh where they do have the ability to show it at the full thing 4k resolution 3d 120 frames per second such theaters do exist uh strangely they pointed out uh, in the article where they were writing about this how they actually demonstrated this at a theater that had been tricked out in los angeles to show it at the full thing but they never used that for actual commercial purposes. They just tricked right, it out. Right, they probably brought in the equipment and then... That's yeah. right. It was kind of a, a specialized one-time thing that they did. So it does exist. Uh, but I mean, honestly, um, this is... I, I don't think it's like a waste or anything like that because, yes, it's ahead of the infrastructure that we have right now. But it's kind of saying you go beyond today's widely available capabilities much like the format that has been created for 4K and 8K, you know, those formats right. can hold more colors and go to brighter nit levels than any display right now can actually show you. But that isn't a reason to say, well, we shouldn't even have that in the format. We're saying one day we'll get there. So the format mm. is ahead of the the practical playback nature. Um, so th this is a case where one day we will have theaters and home displays that can show Gemini Man the way it was shot. In fact, they might exceed the way it was shot, uh, and that content will be sitting there waiting for us. <laughs> well, and not only that, if, if it's only shown a couple of times in a couple of places and directors and uh, content creators go out there to see it specifically right. to, to get as a, as, a, as a tech demo well then if they get excited about it then we're i mean of course I, i've seen the previews for gemini man it just really doesn't look like it needs all this <laughs> it well, looks, seems like it needs a plot that's not so lame but yes <laughs> maybe it's great maybe it's the best movie that's ever been i, I don't know maybe it's trans, it's some sort of transformative experience and this is just you know the cherry on the the, the cake mm -hmm. that is going to be the world's best movie it looks lame but uh at least it'll look lame in 3d 4k 120 120 frames per second but you know <laughs> it, if people get excited about it then yes it will come you know they will they will make it happen uh we'll see 
We'll and see. I mean, the, I, the yeah, Avatar fun. movies are all in that too. That's the way they've been shot. The right. Avatar movies are that as Has well. Has he started filming the rest of those things yet? I, oh, I, yeah. He's I been working on it for it. a couple of years now, yeah. He's doing I feel like, like some of his actors are going to four or four, five of them right? all at once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like some of his actors are going to die if he doesn't hurry up and get this thing on. Not die, but you know, like age out age of their out. roles. Yeah. It's like you started, you started and you look like this. And now, I mean, after, oh, we'll uh, just digitally redo seven their years of hard drinking, digitally redo <laughs> their faces. It'll be fine. Yep. Oh, God help us all. Rob G, this is not you, this is a different Rob. He says, we have talked about, uh, we've talked a bit about Impact la Input Lab for gamers. And most TV and projector reviews these days include a mention of how many milliseconds of lag the display has. But what about AV receivers? If you are connecting your gaming system to a receiver that is passing the video through to your TV, is a receiver potentially adding any lag? Is anybody publishing measurements to show whether AV receivers introduce additional latency? And if so, how much? Yes, they can. They can. They can. 100%, they They've done it to me. So the way to combat this is to uh, turn off any video processing mm -hmm. that's within your receiver. So uh, sometimes we tell you to turn it on if you want to and, and have it do nothing, but still turn it on in order to get menus on your screen. Or to like uh, uh, when you press the volume up and down to have that show up as a graphic on your screen. Right. Um, yeah, because if you don't, on most, if you don't have the video processing activated, not necessarily doing any actual scaling or manipulation of the signal, but just active, uh, the video yeah. chip inside the receiver active, then very often it won't put up, you know, like that volume display, for example. Um, but yeah, if you turn all of that completely off, which pretty much all AV receivers let you do, then at that right. point, it is very much just a true pass-through of the signal, as though you just connected two ends of an HDMI cable together, and, you know, there it goes. Yeah. Uh, the other thing you I could do... I always had do... a problem with uh, rock band and mm -hmm. latency going mm -hmm. through everything, because it's because timing was such a right. huge part of that game. We had to really be very, very careful about, you know any sort of latency that we had. And every time I got a new projector for in for testing or whatever, it was always like, okay, we got to reset everything. And, you know, I got to go with the drum thing and make sure that right. the drums are synced up. And yeah. Yeah. The other thing you could potentially look at doing is turning off the HDMI lip sync setting. Because yeah. if there is going to be any latency introduced into the HDMI signal, it would be because it's attempting to synchronize it with the audio section. So if you turn off the HDMI auto lip sync, that is the other thing. Now, if you do all that, it shouldn't introduce any additional latency. Uh, but... I don't know of a resource. Uh, it might exist. If it does, it's it's some person doing it on a forum. So that might right. exist somewhere. But I don't know of like a, you know, a professional website or something who's keeping a uh, spreadsheet of this, of AV receivers and how much uh, input lag they introduce into the video signal. It'd be a tough thing to test because there are so many variables. Um, and well, and... I, and once you turn all that stuff off, it, it's essentially zero. That's uh, right. It should it should be essentially zero. So, That's right. You know, it would be testing it with the lip sync on, but lip sync, of course, is adjustable as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it may or may not. I mean, yeah, I don't know that there's any, any anywhere you can see this, but uh, if you're worried about it for your projector, the key is to turn all that stuff off inside the AV receiver. Yes. Vince, both of Vince's parents have some hearing loss. His mom's is worse, and if she's watching TV on her own, she'll turn the volume on their 65-inch Sony X8, X900E all the way up to max, which is too loud to bear for anyone else, including Vince's dad, even though he has some hearing loss too, probably from listening to the TV at max. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Vince. Vince tried to hooking up the Yamaha YAS207 soundbar, but that still wasn't enough. It didn't solve the issue of his mom needing the volume level much higher than everyone else. Naturally, he thought of headphones, but his mom absolutely will not wear them. Well, you see, you got a problem here. The problem is your mom. So Vince was thinking maybe he could set up a pair of speakers on the, on the table right next to her, but they definitely don't want long cables stretching across the room. So are there any wireless speakers we could suggest that would let her listen to them at a close proximity while everyone else can listen to the Yamaha soundbar. Boy, this is going to sound weird in this room. You can do, um, there's so many, you know, speaker, you know, wireless speaker connect uh, solutions. Uh, what, SVS has one? Uh, is it? Um, Prime Wireless. Yep. 
Uh, it's not the one I was. Is that the Prime Wireless? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Outlaw Audio has one. Yeah. As well. As, or, well, that's so, just a I transmitter mean, receiver, not the speakers themselves. Right. No. You would need that stuff. But I would get like speakers that had their own volume on them. So something like computer speakers, like the audio engine ones I have, yeah. would be good. Yeah. But uh, that way you could just plug them into a receiver and you, would, you wouldn't have to add anything else. They still have to be plugged in. So I assume that because this, it, it, whenever you tell me about somebody's parents' house, I think they've got an old couch that's sitting right on the wall, and the TV's across the room from them, and there's knickknacks everywhere. So I imagine you know they'll have to be two speakers right to her left or right, you know, if she's sitting on the end of the couch, or right in front of her on the um, coffee table. But there are going to have to be wires. You yeah, pow power cables. There will have to be power yeah. cables at the very least. But yeah, the thing to be very concerned about here to me is, I mean, obviously, even if these speakers are right up close to her, they're still probably going to be turned up pretty darn loud uh, by the description he's giving of how severe yeah. her hearing loss is, which means you don't want that sound, which will still be audible to everyone else, uh, and the sound that is still coming from the Yamaha soundbar, to be out of synchronization at all, because then you'll get an echo. It'll sound it like be. an echo. And it would th talk about latency. These yes. things, you know, absolutely add latency because they're transmitting. It has to be transmitted over the air and then both encoded and decoded at either side. Yeah. So there is going to be latency there. So I think everybody's going to end up listening to mom's speakers. <laughs> that, I mean, that is one way. But what I would point you to is Aventry. Uh, has some nice systems that use aptX low latency, and it is darn near instantaneous. Uh, I've used this okay. myself. Haven't had to adjust the lip sync setting for the other speakers that aren't on this aptX low latency system uh, at all. Um, even though, yes, I think it is about four milliseconds difference, that is not enough for you to perceive it even as the slightest bit of echo. Uh, so yeah. they have these ones. These are nice and small, uh, a $60 set of a transmitter and a receiver unit uh, using the Aptex low latency. They call it the Aventry Lock. Um, they come, as the name implies, locked to one another, so no other signals interfere, and they just send between the two of them. Now, you would then... Uh, on the TV side, you know, plug in the 3.5 millimeter output from your TV uh, into the transmitting uh, unit of this Aptex low latency from Aventry. And then the receiving unit, you would plug that into a pair of self-powered speakers. Um, so, I mean, these are really small. They're powered by USB. They actually have a battery built in. So even if uh, you need to move them around or something, it, it'll keep working off of battery power for six hours is what they claim. So then it's just a matter of which self-powered speakers do you connect them to. Lots of good choices out there. I very much agree with uh, Tom's suggestion of audio engine. Um, those can play very loud, very clearly, uh, without they're being... They're very small. They're very small. So those check all the boxes. SVS's prime wireless speakers could be an option just as self-powered speakers, but they're considerably larger. Uh, don't make right. any mistake about how large they are, but very good sound quality. There's also Klipsch's. Uh, self-powered monitors that they sell, which if you're talking about something that can play loud, <laughs> Klipsch's self-powered monitors, like almost all Klipsch speakers, uh, that, that can get the job done on there. There's the R51 PMs and the smaller R41 PMs. So all of these, I wouldn't necessarily be making use of any of their built-in wireless if they have it. You'd still need a transmitter somewhere to send the signal anyway. So right, I would right. just go with this Aventry Aptex low latency as the transmitter and receiver and just connect it to a pair of self-powered speakers. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of understand where your mom's coming from with not wanting to wear headphones. You know, sure. You feel like you're not part of the group or whatever's going on. But, you know, this this is a really hard thing to get around. I mean, I understand she has got hearing loss and I don't know what the other solutions are as far as maybe, you know, he hearing aids or, you know, I, I imagine she probably already has that yeah. stuff going on, but having stuff blaring into your ears certainly can't be, uh, I mean, I, it kind of feels like there, there should be a solution that's at your, on your mom that you could fix. Cause if not, I mean, it, I, I could see why everybody else would be like, well, I'm just going to go watch TV in the, kitchen <laughs> right well I can't, interestingly I um like with uh today's hearing aids my dad went through this lots of hearing aids 
offer a system where you connect a little transmitter to your TV yeah. or a sound system, yeah. and it sends the audio directly to the hearing aids. Um, See, that to me seems like the, would be the best solution. But I would... th there's a problem with those, which is that they have latency. Oh, uh, that's true too. Uh, 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 now, you could look for one that specifically talks about because they don't use aptics it's it's always a proprietary signal that yeah, goes yeah, yeah. to um hearing aids uh so i mean you know your iphone has this as well right uh iphones have a hearing aid output that puts the sound directly into compatible hearing aids so you could look for one there there i don't know for sure i i would hope by now somebody is making one that is low latency but hearing aids are one of those things where they they it's practically uh you know a a scam at this way they're so overpriced and yeah, yeah, yeah. um the technology isn't nearly that's because it's all what could yeah be. A, lot of, a lot of it's kept a, a lot of it's paid for by insurance so the that's that right you start you start being able to charge insurance and all of a sudden everything costs a bajillion percent yeah. more than it actually should so it's something uh, you could potentially look for if you do find some hearing aids that offer this and they specifically say that they have a low latency so that you don't get that weird echo effect uh, between, you know, the TV speakers that are still playing or the sound bar and well, what's coming into if the If she can't hear the sound aids. bar anyways, you just turn the sound bar down enough so that she can't hear it and everybody else can. But I bet it still has and to be pretty loud because his dad has some hearing loss, just not enough that he needs it all the way up at max. I bet it's still pretty loud. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, get them both the same hearing aids, and then that, well, actually, the, yeah, yeah, get the get rid of the sound bar altogether. I don't know. Yeah. It, this we're spitballing over here. I know that these things exist too because my church just implemented like mm -hmm. I want to think I want to say it's called Blue Note or Blue something or whatever that is the same thing, so that you get it beamed right into your your hearing aid. Yeah. He asked, could we talk a bit about the latest PlayStation Four update that added new settings for HDR? Any tips for setting it up correctly? Nope. I have nothing. Let's go on. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so this is um, Sony's attempt. Oh, I don't have a PlayStation Four, so I don't right. care. This is Sony's attempt to start implementing some of what they proposed as part of the HDR gaming interest group, the HGIG. Uh, so this is where, instead of the game output being a fixed thing that the display then has to tone map. Uh, this is where you actually inform the game system how the display tone maps, and then the game adjusts its output to match the tone mapping of the display. So it's a little bit of a reverse thing. The fixed variable is now the display, and the game system adapts to it. That's the way that they're approaching this issue. So it's a setting that just shows up in your display and sound settings. It says uh, HDR adjustment or adjust HDR, something like that. And it actually just gives you three quite simple test patterns with very simple instructions, which is just a full white screen with a little HDR logo on it. And it says, adjust this until you can barely see the letters HDR anymore. And then it gives you a small white window within a big black screen. And again, there's the letters HDR printed within that small white window. And it says, again, adjust this. Uh, all you're doing is pressing left and right until you can barely see the letters HDR. And then it's a full black screen with the letters HDR. And you adjust it until you can barely see the letters HDR. So all you do is click it up until it completely vanishes and then click it back one or two clicks until you can barely see those letters again. And what is now doing is setting the full frame average light level. That's the full white screen. Then it's setting the, um, you know, for like a 10% window type of screen because a lot of HDR displays can show a small window brighter than a full white screen. That's super common. And then the black level as well. The instructions are pretty straightforward. Uh, it's not a difficult adjustment to do at all. It's important that your ambient light levels are where they're going to be while you're yeah. playing this game. So this is something you might need to adjust at different times of the day. If you play with sunlight coming in and you play at night, you'll want to readjust it because it's not going to look completely perfect if you pick one setting and leave it there. But more than that, the games all have to be patched to actually use it. So right now, No Man's Sky is the only game that works with this the one and only and it's hilarious because there there are people on that's... youtube posting these things they're like look at this hdr game look at how different it is i'm like uh no it doesn't 
It doesn't look any different because nothing changed because that game doesn't support it yet. It's like pure yeah. placebo effect for these people. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, no Man's Sky, but that 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 was isn't that dumpster fire of a game that came out with all these promises and none of the things were true. <laughs> oh, is that the, the one? It's uh, it's, it's uh, since been patched quite since a bit. Been updated but, a lot. That's right. Oh, I I'm sorry. I refuse to support any game. Well, I don't buy games. That's I guess apparently not true. Like yesterday, I bought a Switch, so I didn't actually Whoa. buy it. My ten year old my ten year old son has been saving his money mm-hmm. for months. And uh, finally got enough money to, you know, after allowances and birthdays and everything else to buy a Switch in the game. Nice. So now we have a Switch, which I hooked up yesterday. Sweet. And, uh, yeah, it's a thing. Get the goose. Uh, Go get the untitled but yeah, goose I don't... game. Yeah. <laughs> goose game, please. I no, love that game. He'll get... He'll get it's uh, very short. He's got uh, Mario Kart. And okay. And I think... He'll probably get Super Smash Brothers, but we'll see. I'm I'm not encouraging him to buy anything. So, but he, he's now <laughs> saving his money for more games. We'll do one more question. Then we're going to be done. Okay. Carl and Jonathan both emailed us to say that the Guardian in the UK wrote an article entitled "Deafening Cinema Sound Is Ruining Films." They use Hugh, Hugh Grant's recent Twitter complaint because that's apparently news about his experience watching The Joker as a springboard to write about volume levels in cinemas and how some safety groups are now recommending the average level be limited to 80 db instead of 85 db they also uh touch upon the issue of distortion versus outright sound pressure level and how most of the discussion is about average spl uh and peaks but not much is being said about background and ambient noise levers level so what's our take are theaters too loud in jonathan's case he says that when he and his wife use his home theater so that 50 percent of the audience agrees with hugh grant that it's too loud um <laughs> Yeah, you can so, guess who the fifty percent. Yeah, I can guess who the fifty <laughs> out of Jonathan and his so, wife. <laughs> yes, there are my. I think my wife thinks my cinema is too loud when we're watching home theater, but uh, when we're watching a movie, especially a Marvel movie, but she doesn't think it's too loud when we're watching anything else because I don't turn it up very uh, uh, nearly as loud. But distortion is really the issue here, more often than not. Theaters are okay. I'm going to talk about IMAX second. Most theaters they're mostly fine and i mostly wish they would turn it up a little bit mm. uh but the times i have not enjoyed myself in a theater has been because there is clearly a speaker that's having an issue uh a, just a, a torn woofer uh you know some sort of distortion that's going on that's very very clearly what's happening uh the fact is is that there even though these are very big rooms you you know it, you're sharing walls with other theaters that are playing movies that oftentimes are still coming through, especially if it's, there's a lot of bass happening. So you do have to consider that when you're setting your volume levels. IMAX, on the other side, other hand, I often find are just like trying to piss me off. I'm like, come on, guys. <laughs> I don't need a headache this bad. And I really want to see this movie. I'm excited about it. And I love it that you love it loud like I love it loud. But you love it too loud. And you need to turn it down a little bit. <laughs> so in those cases, I would agree. But generally speaking, uh, you know, as long as you're not having distortion, as long as the, you're not having any issues with the speakers, you know, 85 dB, eight, you know, first of all, the difference between 80 and 85 dB is not going to be something I think most people are really going to notice all that much. But... Well, it's about the it's about the standard is what they're talking about right, saying that right. you know the 85 dB standard is an older standard that was based upon older uh, research and that and that the newer research says eh, it might not be a bad idea to limit our exposure to sound pressure levels anywhere above 80 uh, to shorter lengths of time than the old standard. Well, and standards. our movies are also getting longer too since well, there's that you too. know those standards came out, you know. A 90 minute movie was a movie. There was no Right. You know, and sometimes the action sequences movies. carry on for a much longer duration with higher average sound levels over a longer yeah. duration than uh, movies you know from long ago type of thing that had short action sequences. Uh, I mean, for me, the experience in going from theater to theater, even like each individual theater within one given cineplex, right, yeah. uh, can be significantly different. Some of them I find too quiet. I'm like, this yeah. needs to be louder. And it's just a matter of either they kind of skimped on the audio system or that's just the way it happens to be set up. Um, there are certain, you know, I know enough of my local theaters to know the particular 
auditorium within the cineplex that i like um and i know where i want to sit and you know book my advanced ticket with reserved seating and i know the ones that i like uh but it isn't a super consistent experience for me and it's kind of funny because this is going back to like the whole reason george lucas started the thx program with the release of you know uh empire strikes back because he was like I want people to actually hear my movie <laughs> the way I intended for them to hear it. And it's so inconsistent from theater to theater. I yes. don't think it's as bad as it was back then. I don't think the difference from theater to theater is as great as it was back then. Well, the but same it's thing still... happened with like Jurassic Park came out too. That's it's right. the same sort of deal where it, I mean, like, first you couldn't DTS. show this movie if you didn't have this quality of speaker and That's subwoofer right. and surround sound and everything else. You weren't allowed. You weren't yeah. allowed to even rent the movie or, you know, whatever, lease the movie, however they call it. So, yeah, I, I mean, to that, I, I totally agree with Rob. There have been, I have literally, I saw Air Force One and we drove for a special Dolby's, you know, surround sound because that back then, or DTS, whatever it was, theater to go, is that how far back that was and it was just surround sound and the entire movie was in stereo it was very low it was kind of very hard to hear and the last five minutes of the movie you could almost hear the click of the switch as somebody went oh this is supposed to be in surround sound and they flipped the switch all of a sudden everything sounded great i mean it was that that dramatic of a difference so i i agree with rob i mean there's there's some cinemas that you know you just spend the whole time wishing they would do something and then there's others you're like okay seriously like for real who are you trying to impress here well yeah i mean the that last transformers movie that i ever saw in a movie theater and never will again until they <laughs> change something but I, I mean that that that's the first time in a long time where i actually had my fingers covering my ears because i was actually worried for yeah. my hearing because it was yeah. so that movie was so long and so loud the entire way through that I was like that this is it's painful I'm worried about my hearing but that has not been my experience at all across the vast majority of movies I've seen like I say a lot of the theaters I go to I actually wish they would turn it up so I don't think you can take this one complaint of Hugh Grant's one experience at one particular auditorium seeing one particular movie. I mean, I saw a Joker, had no problem with the audio level, but I went to one of the theaters that I know I like their sound system, how it's set up, and it to me it was it was great. It was exactly where I would have it if I were setting it myself. Um, so I don't think it's a completely generalized this is this applies to every auditorium everywhere type of thing but certainly i agree yeah some of them are not tuned right yeah up or down yeah that's right i think i saw when i saw resident evil i saw the first resident evil movie Mm -hmm. there was a torn woofer on one of the one of the side surrounds yeah and whenever a sound would hit there i would just look up at that speaker and just like you son of a that's (laughs) right just like just growl at it like oh this is so bad and distracting (laughs) it's so bad so i mean and and honestly just one last point what you may think as a theater is is too loud is actually them turning it up to the same loudness that you may have heard in another theater and saw it was fine, but their their system is not up to snuff and there's adding right. so much distortion and that's what you're finding objectionable. Yep, absolutely. Not, I said object, objectionable, right? I think I did. <laughs> but that's what you're having a problem with. You're not you're having a problem with that distortion. Mm-hmm. That distortion will bother you far more uh, at far lower volumes than actual volume will bother you. Yeah, and. So, Ironically, it isn't always the bigger theater where you need higher output levels. Very often, the biggest auditorium, they've spent the money to put in the good sound system. It's very often the physically smaller auditorium, and they kind of skimped on the sound system, and that's the one that's distorting. I've I've certainly had that experience. So who we got left, Rob? We have Brian F. and Brannon M. Uh, I also put Sean W.'s question, but his actually came in on Monday, and I don't usually do that. I thought we might get that far down the list, but we didn't, so it's all right. moot. You guys are on the list. Uh, it'll be answered next week with a guest co-host. Let's thank our listeners of the week. We want to th- let- thank our 86 patrons over at patreon.com. 
Indeed, that's patreon.com slash avrantpodcast if you'd like to sign up. Think of it as an automatic monthly donation or a voluntary subscription. Thanks to our 86 patrons over there, including Brian F., who is one of our patrons, and let us know that he's one of our patrons. I also want to thank Bill for uh, confirming Mike's correction about the 20 amp circuits for last week. For those of you on YouTube who are watching me, I keep looking over your shoulder. Oh, they can't see you. Your video is dead over here. Oh, my video is dead? It never came back. Hey. (laughs) File it. Cut it out. I keep looking at the dog. If I had known that, I would have picked my nose. I've been in the pick my nose for a long time. Tom, Jesus. Tom. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's black on my screen anyway. I assume that's what's being fed out to YouTube. But you, you <laughs> shall be, you shall be a logo for large portions of this podcast Whee! episode. Logo. <laughs> I'll have to Bravier- e- put that back in manually. <laughs> I'm doing the extra work to make you a logo. <laughs> uh, I could be. I could be a black box. That's fine. By the way, for thanks, Bill, for, for, for correcting me. I'm going to keep cutting Tom off so we can't end I can see that. All I'm right, trying no, to stop ahead. the podcast. I'm hungry. I haven't eaten yet today. <laughs> for AV Rants, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.